right, everyone. Wow, what a packed room. It's excellent to see everyone still here hanging on. You guys have had a lot thrown at you over the last two days. Um, and I actually want to, before I start, and I'm, I do not have enough slides to go for 50 minutes. I wanna make, I'm going to try to keep it really high level um, to really help sort of you know, conceptualize this concept of biomarkers because you hear about it all the time um, and really put it in the context of the clinical trials that we're trying to develop and, and really the significance that these biomarkers, this particular biomarker especially, has um, on our, you know, chances to have treatments for DO15Q. Um, but I do want to take a minute to sort of jump off of what Carrie said around just the kind of how aspirational and inspirational this, this, this conference is. You know, I, and I actually wrote about this in, for Spectrum News like many years ago. I was at a, um, one of the science meetings and it was one of my first meetings. And back then we had like the science meeting and then it kind of bled into the family meeting. And so it turned out that the science meeting, the second day of it, was um, mostly the clinical talks. And I was supposed to give like a clinical overview of DO15Q to a group of you know, folks like Dr. Fink, who I'm, I'm sure many years ago had not seen a lot of kids with DO15Q, but was working on understanding mechanisms of epilepsy and the disease in his PhD. There were a lot of basic scientists in that room, neuroscientists, molecular biologists, geneticists, who had never, ever, ever seen a child with DO15Q syndrome, yet they were studying you know, preclinical models and all the important things that have to be done, as we'll talk about, to get us to treatments and trial, trials and treatments and, you know, better outcomes and quality of life for our kids, which is the goal. Um, but anyway, so I'm sitting there, I'm about to give this talk, and at the same time as I'm about to give that talk, the parade is supposed to start. And I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, why in the world am I giving them a lecture on DO15Q syndrome and showing them videos when, like, the reality is right downstairs. Like those are the people that you're trying to help here. Um, so I stopped my talk. I like had one slide that I presented, and then I was like, "We're going to stop, and we're all going to take a little, you know, detour downstairs." Um, and we all went downstairs. And mean, by the way, the meeting was a, a tenth of the size. I mean, this is extraordinary. The number of people that are here now. It was a lot smaller back then. So we all went downstairs and watched the parade. And I will tell you, not only was there not a dry eye amongst the, the researchers and, and scientists, but it wasn't, it wasn't sadness. It was this like extraordinary, you know, infusion of hope and excitement about the fact that like this was the community that they were helping. And the second piece that happened after that is we went back upstairs and I would say that the meeting was definitely infused with a different level of purpose. But also, there were new questions that started to get asked. So one of the mouse model researchers who was there, you know, said, I noticed that a lot of these kids have really low tone. Like, they seem like they're a little bit floppy, and a lot of them are in wheelchairs. Why aren't we studying motor function in the mice? Like, why are we focusing on, like, just, just you know, the cognition and social behavior? And, and then a whole discussion would ensue. That wouldn't have happened if I was just giving a lecture or showing videos, right? And so I think the opportunity to have meetings like this where there's like actual crosstalk and collaboration between scientists and researchers and clinicians and all of you is invaluable. And you have to know like we learn from you as much or more than what you learn from us, hands down. So like please like remember that and like take take that with you because it is, I mean, we are not just driven by each of you, but we learn from you, you know, and it really does drive the work that we're doing. And so um, it's the reason that I do what I do, and I think that's true for a lot of us. And so I, I think if you get to meet some of the clinicians and researchers, um, especially the researchers during this meeting, like go up and talk to them, you know, and tell them about your experience with your kiddo um, because I think they'll really appreciate that as well. So. Um, anyway, with that, I'll get started. Um, and I'm not giving a clinical talk, actually. I'm going to talk to you about the biomarker um, work, kind of in the context, again, of, of all the talk that you have heard over the last few days about clinical trials. Um, and so initially, the title of the talk was Demystifying Biomarkers, because we're going to sort of go back to the basics. Um, but I actually had, like, sort of a second title to this talk, which is the biomarker that brought me to DO15Q syndrome, because it actually turns out that the research into the biomarker that we'll discuss, the EG biomarker, really was my main introduction into research in DO15Q syndrome. And so it really has opened up a lot of doors and again has ultimately, we, we think, led to a clinical trial, hopefully not the only one. Um, so we're gonna start, I'm gonna give you a little introduction to kind of 
biomarkers in the context of precision health. Then we'll talk about what we know about the CG biomarker in DUP15Q syndrome. I'm going to show you some data, but I'm going to definitely make sure to explain it. And if you have questions, please ask. But I want to do that because all these papers are already published. And I know you guys hear about it and maybe even have pulled them from PubMed and have taken a look. So I want to walk you through the data a little bit so that you kind of understand what it is that we have um, learned you know, from all the research that many of you have participated in. Um, we'll talk about how that biomarker is relevant to the upcoming trial, and then I'll open it up for questions and discussion. Okay, so I want to start with kind of the North Star. Like, this is ultimately the goal, and I quote our beloved Obama from many years ago in his State of the Union address when he actually announced um, new NI funding, government funding for a precision health initiative at the National Institutes of Health, and he defined precision health as delivering the right treatment to the right patient every time. That's what we'd like to do, right? That's what we want to do as clinicians. It's what we'd like to achieve for all of our patients. Um, I'd say in the genetic conditions and in the neurodevelopmental disorders, which is largely what um, I specialize in and what many of us focus on, you know, I'd add that we want to make sure we're delivering the right treatment at the right time. Um, and then ideally, we want to do it accessibly and affordably, right? We need to make these treatments available so that they're actually able to be scaled out into clinics. So just remember this, if nothing else. Like, this is, this is where we want to land. We're not there yet, but I will tell you we're closer in do 15 q than we are in a lot of other conditions, and that's really exciting. Um, so in the, I'm going to sort of talk broadly right now about kind of the neurodevelopmental disorder space because that's where there's been a lot of work in thinking about ways to get to more precision therapeutics. And in that space, what's been happening is that we recognize there's a big broad spectrum of kids who have autism or intellectual disability or global developmental delay, right? It is, and I mean, we know there's heterogeneity even within do 15 q syndrome, right? Every child looks a little bit different. But imagine thinking about treatments for like a big neurodevelopmental disorder. It's hard. And what happens often is we have treatments that we try to use on just a, you know, just a random sampling of kids with autism or intellectual disability, and they don't work. Or they work with a few kids and not in another set of kids. So one real advance that's helped us parse some of that heterogeneity in the neurodevelopmental disorder space is genetics, right? Because we can start saying, well, we know that there's genetic causes of autism, right? And we know that, for instance, there's a subset of kids who have duplications on chromosome 15Q. Can we now take that subgroup and start asking questions around treatment? And it gets us closer to a place of what we consider sort of precision health. And that tailored approach is really where we're moving. Okay, so that's sort of the, again, sort of at the, the, the direction in which we're moving. Um, but what do we need to get from now we identify sort of a genetic cause to actually having a treatment that is available in your clinic? And Eugenie Sutter yesterday from Roche talked a little bit about this. You guys have, again, had trials hammered down your throat for the last three days. But I want to just put this up again just to kind of put it in this context and remind you that there's a lot of steps that we have to take to get to the point of having a drug or a thera any kind of therapeutic um, available in the clinic, right? So we first need what, you know, need to do what James Fink and others do, which is we need to study our preclinical pre models of whatever the condition is to figure out what is the cause of the disease, right? And what can we target to then help make improvements in our patients? Now, in a genetic condition like DO15Q, the good news is we can create models based on knowing what the genetic underpinnings are. Again, a lot harder to do if you're thinking about a model of autism or a model of intellectual disability. But a model of DO15Q, albeit it is challenging as well because there's a lot of genes in the region, it's, it's, a, much more, um, uh, it's a much more accessible goal. So once we make the models, we then have these different phases of trials. And I won't go through all the details of the phases, but really the phases are, um, it, they increase in, in the number of kids we're studying. And it's really based on first establishing what is the, you know, what is the, how does the drug behave in the body, right? Like what, how much do you need to give so that it gets to where it needs to go? Um, how much of the, you know, how much of a dose do we need to give? How safe is it? How much can we dose until we're getting side effects? So we're looking at sort of the properties of the drug, then the safety, and then finally in a phase three trial, which is our classic like big randomized control trial, we're just asking, is this drug effective, right? And that's when we're comparing the drug to a placebo or a comparison. 
And for those of you who are in our fishbowl yesterday, we talked a lot about placebo. I can answer questions about that later if you want. Um, but once we do that last trial, then we can say, well, this drug seems to have worked. Now we can try to get the FDA to approve it to be available. And a lot of the drugs that you guys are prescribed, your children or adults are prescribed today for seizures, for some behavioral aspects of their condition, um, for sleep issues, for GI issues, a lot of those have been studied like this and are FDA approved. Okay, so I sort of talked about this, but just to remind you again, and I'm doing some real basic stuff to start because I think it, again, puts the biomarker work in a little bit of context, and maybe also hopefully pulls together a lot of the jargon you've been hearing across the last couple of days about trials. So how does a trial work, basically? And this is really simplified, but I actually think this is an important rubric, again, when we talk about biomarkers and why trials actually can be hard, right? So when we think about a trial, we start with a group of patients, okay? So that's, that seems straightforward. It's sometimes not that straightforward to like, who do we pick for our group, right? So in a DO15Q trial, of course, we're gonna pick kiddos that do 15 q syndrome, but we might need to think about what's the age range? What kind of co-occurring conditions can they have and not have, right? What, you know, there, there's a lot of different considerations that have to go into play based on what we think the drug does, where we think we might get the most effect, and what might be feasible. Okay, so we choose our, our group of patients, and then we split them randomly into two groups. There's a randomization. So we're not saying like, oh, we think you should be in placebo and you should be in treatment. That doesn't happen, right? It's, it's, a, it's a random selection, and kids get put into two groups. One group gets the treatment, the other group gets the sort of sham treatment or the placebo. And we do that because we need to compare the effectiveness of the drug to non-drug. Um, and so, and the goal of that is that at the end of the trial, if we learn the drug works, then it's available to everyone. So we don't want kids to be on placebo forever, but it allows us to get the answer we need around whether a drug is effective. Okay, so we, we split the population, we do the trial, and then in the end we have to have some kind of outcome that we're measuring to decide is this drug actually working or not, right? So that's, that's sort of the end point. This sounds really straightforward, but I will tell you that we in the neurodevelopmental disorder space have been plagued with every aspect of this. Who goes into a trial? How do you decide what the intervention group, you know, how do you randomize kids? How long is the intervention given? And most importantly, how do you, what outcomes are you gonna measure, right? Like how do we know that the drug's even working? How do we know the drug has even hit the target, which, as we'll talk about, is probably the brain, right, in a neurodevelopmental condition. Oops. Ooh. It's timing me out. I'm spending too long on the slide, clearly. I don't know what just happened. Did it? Well, I'll keep talking. So, um, so yeah, I mean, so the, the um, you know, we, we've struggled so much with different aspects. And I'll tell you the other piece we've struggled with is just the placebo. And we talked about this again in our fishbowl yesterday. There's a very strong placebo effect in a lot of trials, which doesn't mean that power of suggestion, people just think they're getting better. We think that there may be something therapeutic about just being in a trial and being followed closely and having someone pay attention to your child and, and giving, getting feedback about how, you know, how they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Do I need to? Um, and so because of the placebo effect and because we struggle with outcomes and outcome measures, oftentimes what happens in neurodevelopmental disorders is that our trials are deemed failures. So we do these big trials, right? And you guys are maybe reading about autism trials. There's so many drug trials in autism. And you've probably seen that they say, oh, this drug doesn't work in autism, and this one failed, and this one failed. It may not be because the drug doesn't work, right? It might actually be because the trial was not designed in a way that allowed us to actually know if the drug could work. And so our field has been, in the last few years, in this place of taking stock and saying, we have therapeutics in the pipeline. Like, we now need to empower and power ourselves to get trials in place that are actually gonna work. Okay, so you're probably like, why is she going on about this? Well, this is where the biomarker comes in. Because there are ways that we can make these trials a lot more effective, if you will. And I don't mean effective necessarily in like showing a, a response, but effective in the sense of at least telling us if there could be a response or not, okay? so. What's a biomarker? Okay, so the buzzword of the day. And this is a buzzword not just in DO15Q, it's a buzzword all through the neurodevelopmental disorders um, space. So by definition, this is an FDA definition, a biomarker is a characteristic that's objectively measured and evaluated as an indication either of a normal biological process, so something that normally happens in the body, 
a pathogenic process, so something that's actually causing a disorder or a disease or a problem, or a pharmacological response to an intervention. Okay, so that's a really broad term, right? That could be absolutely anything. So let me dig into that a little bit more. So the FDA, the, F the Food and Drug Administration, actually has specific categories of different kinds of biomarkers. Okay, so one biomarker is not the same for every condition, right? So you can use biomarkers to help you predict if someone's gonna develop a condition. That could also help in trials, right? Because if you can predict someone who is eventually gonna need a therapeutic, you can get in really early. Um, and I'll give you a quick example of that in a minute. Um, we can have diagnostic biomarkers. Those are ones that actually help you make a diagnosis of a condition. We can have biomarkers that what we call are measures of drug target engagement, and I want you to try to sort of remember that term and we're gonna talk about it, because this is the place where our Duke 15Q biomarker has a lot of potential value. What does drug target engagement mean? It means it's a marker of whether the drug is hitting the putative target which in our case, again, for a neurodevelopmental condition is probably gonna be the brain. And then the last is you can have a biomarker that's actually an outcome measure. It tells you that the treatment is actually working. It's a, it's a measure of response to treatment. So there are a lot of indications of biomarkers and all, I'm not gonna go through all the details of this, but there's a vast literature on like, what do you need to do to test a biomarker to figure out if it fits one of these categories? Um, you might ask, well, I, I still don't really get it. Like, what's an example? And I'd, so here's some examples in like other medical conditions. So we're not, we're going out of the neurodevelopmental disorder space, right? We have lots of biomarkers in medicine. So for diabetes, we don't ask uh, someone who might have diabetes, like, how do you feel about eating, you know, after you eat something sweet? Right? Or like, do you feel more tired you know, after you eat a certain meal or do you feel tired at the end of the day? We're not asking subjective measures, we're taking their blood glucose level, right? And we're getting a hemoglobin A1C, that's fundamentally actually a diagnostic biomarker of diabetes and it's actually a great biomarker to track response to treatment. How easy would that be? Wouldn't it be amazing to have a blood test that in our kids that said like, okay, this drug is working really well in your child because I just saw that blood level went down, right? But we don't have that. Um, but that is an example of a great biomarker. For hypertension, we use blood pressure. For obesity, of course, we use weight. For things like anemia, we use a red blood cell count. I mean, you guys can think, of, I just threw like the first few I could think of when I was writing this talk. There's hundreds of really, really well-established biomarkers in medicine. So then the question becomes, well, what, what are we even measure in a neurodevelopmental condition, right? And let's now, well, we're gonna narrow it to do 15Q, I promise, but just, Thinking in that bigger space, like what, where should we look? What do you guys think? Like where's our biomarker? And I've kind of already hinted at it. So it's the EG, exactly, but what do we wanna measure, right? So we wanna look at brain function because we know that it's the brain and brain circuits that are fundamentally affected, right, in a neurodevelopmental condition. And before we talk about EEG, I wanna put this in context that there's a lot of, there are other ways to measure potential brain-based biomarkers. Okay, so we can use EEG. Um, there's also studies that use MRI, which is brain image, another form of brain imaging. We can use eye tracking. Okay, so eye tracking is a way to quantitatively and objectively measure eye movements in response to different kinds of stimuli. In autism, we do a lot of work in eye tracking to establish biomarkers of like social attention and social cognition and things like that. You don't need to have a you know, behavioral measure of anything. You can just quantify where a child's looking and for how long. Um, we can quantify motor function, and that's actually considered kind of a potential biomarker. I have a, that picture up on the right is actually from the Do 50Q family meeting in Redondo where we had that gate mat. Um, and that paper actually we published a couple years ago. This is my colleague, Rajutha Wilson, who studies motor function in kids with Do15Q and other neurodevelopmental conditions. But, you know, and then there, the picture on the bottom right are, are sensors that, uh, that folks are using that you can put on babies and quantify movement. And it's a way to objectively quantify things like hypotonia, right? Which otherwise we as neurologists will like hold a kid and say, oh yeah, he seems a little bit floppy. I think he's a little hypotonic. That's not a biomarker. Right? But if you can quantify it and measure it in an objective way, that sort of gets us in that direction. So I know we all know about the EG, and we're gonna, I'm, I'm leading up big time to the EG, I promise. But I, wanna, I want you guys to sort of have this framework because 
you know, this is a body of work that many, many folks around the country and world are thinking about, and it opens the door for us to be using these kinds of tools in our population too. Just because we have the EEG, which we'll get to, doesn't mean that the door is closed on just that one biomarker. There's a lot of really cool work being done using different kinds of tools to quantify these processes. Now, someone yelled out EEG in the back, and so on cue, I'll say that EEG is the tool that we have used in my lab, and many folks are using around the world to really study brain function and neurodevelopmental disorders. And why is that? Well, EEG happens to, I mean, you all have had millions of EEGs, and I'm sure you're tired of even thinking about EEGs. We use EEGs clinically to diagnose epilepsy, but it turns out, what is EEG, right? So it's a measuring at the scalp of essentially the synchronous firing of millions of thousands and millions of neurons. Turns out when neurons fire, they actually generate at the synapse a tiny, tiny little electrical signal. That's not measurable one neuron to one neuron, but when you have synchronous firing of thousands of neurons, the signal is strong enough that you can, with a very expensive amplifier, measure it at the scalp. Way too expensive for what it does, but yes, so you can measure it at the scalp. And so what you're really measuring is the firing of brain cells in synchrony which is actually the process that we think is affected in DUP15Q and other neurodevelopmental conditions. So EEG is a really beautiful tool to study brain function in real time. Okay, so with that EEG, we can kind of break it down, and I think actually someone in the science meeting used exactly this, the same slide, but um, you can, can you see my cursor? Yeah, so we can break down that signal into different component frequencies from really slow to really fast, the slowest being delta, um, which occurs at about like one to two hertz. So that means like one to two oscillations a second um, up to beta, which we're gonna hear a lot about in a minute, um, which is about 15 to 30 hertz or 15 to 30 cycles a second up to gamma. Each of these have different kind of functional, um, uh, functional meanings, if you will, and are, and are regulated by different biological systems. I'm not gonna get into all that, but we can measure those really, really nicely and quantitatively. Um, and what's important, relevant to our condition, is that DO15Q, is that all these signals are really tightly regulated by not just the, how the neurons are firing, but all the neurotransmitters that are in the milieu, like GABA and glutamate and others. And so the, that EEG is a readout of the functioning a lot, of a lot of these aspects of the neural system. So EEG is a great tool. It also, though, happens to be a lot more feasible than some of those other tools that I showed you. Now, granted, eye tracking is very doable, but if we really want to measure the brain, compared to something like MRI, which some of your kids may have had an MRI, I'm guessing they had to be put under general anesthesia to do an MRI, right? I mean, it is not a trivial um, test to do. EEG, on the other hand, I mean, granted, it's not fun. I'm not going to pretend that it's like a great you know, exciting, fun thing for kids to do, but they can move around and we can still actually measure a lot of those signals I'm talking about. Um, the other thing that's really helpful with EEG is we can measure it consecutively across time and we, can act, we know what a typically developing brain should look like with EEG over time and so we can kind of detect when things are looking a little different, right, in a child who might have a neurodevelopmental disability. Okay, so before I switch to do 15Q, what I want to really tell you, and I, I'm telling you this really to sort of um, reinforce how exciting it is that we have this biomarker in DO15Q. Because I will tell you that the field of autism research and neurodevelopmental disabilities research has been desperately searching for biomarkers for the kind of broader conditions that we're trying to treat. There is actually, I'm a part of this large consortium called the Autism Biomarkers Consortium for Clinical Trials. This is the most money being spent in one project by NIH on autism research, and it's this. They have tasked us, they've said there's five sites, there's five of us around the, five sites around the country, and our task is to use eye tracking and EEG to find autism biomarkers that could be used for trials, right? That is a tall order because autism is very heterogeneous. We're looking at a big range of ages, but this is a huge initiative that we're a part of right now because they want biomarkers for trials for the exact reasons we talked about. They want tar measures of target engagement. They, and when I say they, I mean our funding agencies, but we do actually, we as the scientific field, clinical field, we want measures that could help with diagnosis to help us select kids for trials and then to tell us if a, if a drug is working. Another really big initiative that we're a part of, and um, uh, this is also a five-site study called the Infant Brain Imaging Study, is a study using MRI and EEG to ask whether there are early biomarkers in infancy that predict whether a baby is going to develop autism. 
with the goal that if you can develop predictive biomarkers, you can get kids into trials really early. And this is, uh, again, a study that's ongoing. We're in year four of this one. And I have this pretty map here that just shows that we actually recently published a paper that showed that this is like EEG maps. And the, the details don't matter. The red is like hot, which means um, uh, more connections between those brain regions. And blue is cold, meaning less connections. And we see this pattern of under-connectivity in certain regions and over-connectivity in certain regions in babies as young as three months of age. Who, and these are babies who have older siblings with autism, so they're at higher likelihood of developing autism. Um, but this has been like a four-year effort with like hundreds of babies, and we're finding these differences that might suggest that there's early biomarkers, right? But this is, again, a big, big venture that we're in. Um, and then lastly, in another genetic condition, we've been using EEG in tuber sclerosis complex, which some of you may have heard of. It's another genetic syndrome that's highly penetrant for epilepsy and neurodevelopmental disorders. We found an EEG biomarker, which we found like reduced connectivity across cortical regions in babies with TSC. Um, and actually that has already led to two early intervention clinical trials in TSC, where we're using the biomarker as well as some behavioral measures to put kids into early intervention trials. Um, TSC STEPS is a drug trial, JETS is a behavioral intervention trial that we just closed literally this month. So we're done with that trial, it was five years. And that trial happened only because we had these early biomarkers. So again, I wanna put that all in context for you just to say this is a really exciting time. But what's really cool is that we're like 10 steps ahead of this game and do 15Q. So let's now move over to what you guys are probably most interested in. So in the context of my group having been really engaged in the space of biomarkers for quite some time, um, we found this paper. Uh, and this was in 2013. I didn't find the paper in 2013. It was, I think, maybe 14, because um, we're now, yeah, it was about nine years ago. And this was Larry Ryder's group. And they were actually writing a paper describing the clinical presentation of children with interstitial dupe. Um, and so they described like autism symptoms and some other things. And in the paper, they were like, yeah, by the way, these kids have this EEG pattern that we see just on their clinical EEGs. They, were, they weren't doing any fancy quantification. There was no like, there was no data scientist in the background. They were just looking at the EEG. And what they found, and you, if you can appreciate this, I'm not gonna show you a bunch of what, you know, sort of non do 15 QEGs, but what I'll, I hope you'll appreciate is, do you see this like really fast kind of activity that you see here? Do you guys see that? Like the really fast sort of oscillations? That is a pattern that we don't see in, um, in non do 15 q syndrome individuals. We do see this pattern in patients who are taking GABAergic medications. So like if you or I took a dose of Ativan or Valium or Onfi, our EEG would start looking like that, okay? But these were EEGs done in kids who weren't taking those medications, right? Because a lot of the interstitial kiddos actually don't have epilepsy. So a lot of these children didn't even have epilepsy. And they had these high frequency oscillations. So we saw that paper and we thought, holy cow, this is interesting. This might be a biomarker of DUP15Q. And so again, to remind you of the oscillatory patterns, like those fast patterns that we were seeing were in this beta range right here, okay, in that green. Okay, so let's, you guys have also had genetics hammered down your throats this last two days, so, and this exact slide many times because it's published. But I'll just remind you again, why did we think, ooh, biomarker of dupe 15 q well, I won't get into the interstitial eidic piece. We'll just talk about the, the genes. But as you all know very well, probably better than most out in the world, right, that there's many genes in that duplicated region. UB3A is the imprinted um, gene that does actually have a role in GABA re co-release at the synapse. Um, but there's also this cluster of GABA receptor genes that are overexpressed. And we think that that probably affects GABA neurotransmission in some way. We don't exactly know how, to be honest. But we know that GABA neurotransmission is affected in DUP15Q, right? And that's just the picture of the GABA receptor. And so we, we know that about the genetics, and then we have this, this EEG that looks like someone is literally taking exogenous GABA, right? So we, that link is not that hard to make to say, hmm, these are probably related to each other. And so we took that information and said, we need to quantify this. Like, we need to do a proper study to, to, do, to accomplish a few goals. One is 
let's quantify it. Let's actually see is beta power, is power, meaning the contribution to the EEG, is power in the beta band really higher in DUP15Q compared to kids without DUP15Q? And we thought we should compare kids to typically developing kids who are age matched, but also kids with autism who don't have DUP15Q syndrome. So that was question one. The second is, is it in everyone or is there a range, right? Do we see any variability in it? Um, we also wanted to ask questions like, do you, can you measure this like in a clinical EEG as well as you can with our fancy research EEG? Like, do you need our $100,000 amplifier? Or can we do it with a clinical recording? Um, so we wanted to ask questions around the, whether this was a biomarker and what the properties were. So we basically just hit the, you know, just hit the, hit the pavement, basically. And, we, and you guys were really helpful here. So we had a grant, a big, a big um, Intellectual Developmental Disabilities Research Center grant. This was when I was at UCLA. And we had kiddos, some of you may have come to UCLA, but we also realized that we were not gonna get enough information if we asked everyone to fly to Los Angeles because even if you live in Los Angeles, to come 10 miles to the west side can take you know, an extraordinary amount of time. And so we wanted to alleviate the burden on families as much as possible, so we brought our lab to the meetings. And we were at three consecutive family meetings. We only did EEG at the first two, Orlando and Redondo Beach. And these are some pictures of kiddos getting their EGs done. The middle is Scott Huberty, who is a former research assistant who's now a graduate student. Um, Vanessa is in the right, who used to be the executive director of the Alliance, who's here actually doing some testing with kiddos. Um, and we collected data on almost 100 kids doing it this way. Now, for those of you who are involved, you know we also were collecting clinical data, right? We wanted to know what are the, what are the developmental features of DO15Q, what measures behave well in do 15 q meaning which ones are going to give us a good range of, a, of abilities, which ones tell us that kids have, really show us the abilities of our kids rather than um, having kids sort of stuck at the floor on some of these assessments. So we did a lot of assessment because we really wanted to also ask about clinical endpoints, right, for the trial. And I'm not talking about that today. But this is how we did this work, was just getting out there into the community. And we thank you guys a lot for being so willing and enthusiastic to do this work with us. Um, this is actually our team yesterday or two days ago. Um, that's uh, Maddie, uh, um, uh, Maddie, Anna, and Charlotte. And they're all over in the suite um, doing developmental testing today. Um, but we've been really, it's been, we've been fortunate to be able to come to meetings to do this work. And so with all that, so we collected all the data, and then I had you know, my, my incredible fancy data analytics signal processing team go in and just you know, ask the questions. Can we quantify beta oscillations? Are they different? What are the properties? And all this is published, but I'm gonna walk you through it quickly because I think it's helpful just to know what we found. And I have pictures of two graduate students who really drove a lot of this work. Um, so the first was that beta power is significantly higher in DO15Q compared to kids without DO15Q. This is a heat map, so it's like a way to take our, our power and just put like colors on it. So red is hot, meaning there's a lot more, more power in those brain regions. And what you'll see, you'll appreciate, I'm sure, is that this, this is, we'll just focus on the top row. This is DO15Q, and we're just looking at power in the beta band. This is a, a group of kids with autism who have, were IQ matched, but did not have DO15Q syndrome. And these are typically developing controls age matched. And so it's not hard to appreciate that, wow, do these kids have much higher beta power. And the effect size here, for any of you who are data folks, was almost, um, was more than one, which is just not an effect size we normally see in these kinds of studies. We're seeing effect sizes of like 0.2, 0.3 in most biomarker studies. So this was like a slam dunk, huge difference. Um, this is just another way to look at those data. You can see kind of the range here of beta oscillations in our DO15Q kids compared to our typically developing kids and our kids with autism. Um, we then asked some other questions, as I said, about properties. We found that this biomarker is present in kids with both interstitial and IDIC, and there's actually not a difference between the two. Um, we found that we could measure this with clinical EEG just as well as we can with our very fancy expensive research system. We found that it's pretty stable over time, so we had some kids come back multiple times. Um, and we actually also found that we could measure this in our kids with paternal duplications, which are a very, we only had a handful. And I bring this up because the difference in the paternal duplications, as I'm sure you, many of you know, is they don't have the maternally imprinted UB3A duplicated, but they have all the other genes. And so it suggested to us that those GABA receptor genes are really critical for driving this biomarker. 
Um, I'm going to show you, I, I actually won't get into, this is just the data to support what I just told you about the different uh, properties. So this just shows you that interstitial and eidic both have, so this, this peak is that beta right here. This is a different way to look at the EEG. It's called a power spectral density plot. Details don't matter, but it's just showing you power in the different bands. This is beta. So we see equally high power in interstitial and isodicentric green and orange. We actually also see high beta in both epilepsy and no epilepsy, so there was no difference there. This is showing the beta peak in our very high density net fancy EEG. Um, and this is in the clinical EEG, which is less, you know, electrodes, 17 electrodes, but we still see it. That's great, so we don't have to use our, again, big expensive system to quantify. Um, and this just shows the stability over time. This was a little bit more crude because we didn't set up to do a longitudinal study, so this was just convenient sample of kids that we had seen more than once. All this is published already. So, um, and then this lastly is the, inter the uh, paternal duplication finding. Um, and all I'll note is that this is like sort of a, a violin plot. So this is all the kids would do 15Q and beta power, oops, oops, oops. I'm gonna get to that in a second. Um, this yellow dot is this child with the paternal duplication, so it's high. And then this is the other, these are two kids with paternals. So uh, anyway, just to make the point that kids with paternal duplications also have the high beta. Um, and I'm, I'm showing you this because these are the figures that actually came out of the many papers that we published here. So if you guys ever pull out one of those papers, if you're interested, now you have hopefully some context behind some of these figures and what they mean. Um, I'm going to take a quick aside and then we're going to end um, by talking about the trial and how this biomarker fits in. So we, we quantified this biomarker and, you know, we talked about kind of the properties of biomarkers and how they could be used. We'll talk about that in a minute with the trial. But as we were doing this work, you know, we sort of started mulling over what is really the significance of this. So it's clearly a readout of what's going on in the genetics, right? I'll just say that sort of simply. But the question then came up for me, which was like, is there functional significance to an EG, a brain, that has high beta kind of resonating all the time, right? And so that took us to sort of the next question, which is, what does their EG look like during sleep? Because we know that sleep is actually defined by the EG. So the stages of sleep, right? We talk about stage one, two, three, four, and then REM sleep, which is when you're dreaming. That's all based on what your brain activity is actually looking like during, you know, and in sleep what happens is your brain goes from super active and like, you know, responding to the environment to really slow. And then, and when it's really slow, there's certain um, features that come out like sleep spindles, we call them, that are in a certain stage of sleep. Sleep spindles are, this, are really what they're reflecting is your, the deep structures of your brain, like your hippocampus, literally consolidating memories and consolidating knowledge. So we see sleep spindles in sleep, we see this like gradual slowing so that your brain gets to actually get into like a little bit of default mode to rest from the day. Right? And then you get into REM, which is like that very active time in your brain, but where your body is very still, but your, um, there's a lot of, again, sort of activity occurring. And we know that sleep is really important for memory consolidation, for learning. I mean, we all know this, right? You guys are all so sleep deprived. I'm sure, especially those of you who have dupers with you on this, you know, on this trip all in one hotel room, I can't even imagine you know, what you guys are facing with sleep. But I know, I mean, 99% of my patients that I take care of struggle with sleep issues, the parents and the child. The parents because of the child, right? And it's a vicious circle. You don't think clearly when you haven't slept well, right? I mean, and so your child probably doesn't either. And so the question we had was, can we quantify sleep physiology in these kiddos? And you know, are there sort of biomarkers that tell us something about the health of sleep? And this is, a, I'm going to show you two slides on this because this is still an area that we're going to continue to explore because I think this is really exciting, untapped, and uncharted territory for us when we think about other therapeutics. But I talk about it here because it really was born out of our, our identification of this biomarker. So we, what we did was, so Vidya, who is this grad student, I showed you her picture earlier on the top right, this was part of her graduate work. Um, she basically, and you guys, many of you probably were involved with this, I mean, in the room, I can't see everyone here, but we just, with the alliance, called families and said, if you've had an overnight EEG, could you please mail it to us? Because we had no way of, like, uploading EEGs. I mean, this was, like, so crude, but this is what we did. And, like, you know, hats off to all of you. You all did it. So we got CDs in the mail. Like, they were coming to my house <laughs> with just... 
you know, EEGs. And the problem with the EEG is that every system is different. You have to figure out how to harmonize the data. So Vidya, actually, with our data team, really spent a lot of time figuring out how do we get data out of all these clinical EEGs. But she did it. Um, and what she found was really quite, I think, extraordinary. And again, I think an area for us to really pursue. Okay, so I'm gonna walk you through this. So a typical, I mean, let's start with the bottom. This is what typical sleep should look like. Now, I'm just gonna say this is looking just at slow brain activity, so delta power. The way we define sleep stages, remember, is how much slow activity is in the brain. And what your brain's supposed to do over the course of a night is oscillate from like fast, fast to get really slow, and then it gets faster again, you kind of wake up a little bit, and then you go back into slow wave, and then you wake up a little bit, and then slow wave, and then you finally just wake up. You know, fun little tidbit, if you wake up during REM, that's when you remember your dreams, because you've woken up in the middle of like the cycle that you're dreaming in. Um, so that's, that's, and sometimes you don't feel as rested when you wake up in REM because you're, but if you wake up after going through a stage of slow wave sleep, when you're in light sleep again, like stage one, you feel super rested. So that, you know, waking up at the right stage, you can't really control that, but that's, that does affect how you're, how you feel in the morning. But if you look here at a typically developing child, right? So this is Delta power. What you see is over the course of the night, they're cycling through. So the Delta power is going up. They have a lot of slowing. Then it's going down because they're kind of waking up a little bit. Not like awake, awake, but just going into sort of less deep sleep. And then they go back into deep sleep. They, they get back out of it, back into deep sleep. So this deep sleep is happening multiple times in the night. That is what you want to happen. Our kids with Duke 15Q are not doing that. They're staying in, our kids are generally staying in this very sort of light stage of sleep and not getting into what we call slow wave sleep. And I won't take you through the heat map, but that's just really showing you the same thing. So then we quantified this, and this paper just got published last year, okay? And what we found, and I won't walk you through every figure, but I wanna say that what we ended up finding was profoundly reduced slow wave sleep. We also found less spindles, spindle density. And I told you sleep spindles are what we like to see in healthy stage two and three sleep as a marker of kind of learning and memory consolidation. We're not seeing a lot of spindles because kids aren't getting into that stage of sleep actually. Um, and then we did see persistence of high beta throughout. So is the high beta affecting sleep or is it a marker? We don't know yet, but you can imagine this opens the door for us to think about medications that could change sleep physiology, right? And looking at whether that has outcomes in cognitive function or adaptive skills or other things. Um, just to, if you are curious about the figures, this is just, this is spindle density. So like how many sleep spindles there are. And the Duke 15Q kiddo is much less lower spindle density than our typical controls. And then slow wave sleep, much lower slow wave sleep in all brain regions compared to neurotypical. Now, I'm not telling you this to be, to be doom and gloom at all, right? Because what it turns out, this is probably happening in many kids with neurodevelopmental disorders. We just have never looked like this. I mean, in Angelman, Ben Philpott's group has done some really nice work here, and Matt Judson and others. Um, but we really only quantified this because A, all of you were great and gave us your EGs, but B, because we had this awake biomarker that we thought might, you know, be, it gave us a clue, essentially. And I think that this is a really important area of investigation that others need to be exploring. And I think this is an area that we can actually modulate. Okay, so I'm gonna go back now and end with, with the talk about our biomarker, but I think this is really exciting work that, again, we're going to continue to explore. This is all really pretty recent. Okay, so back to our awake biomarker. So we talked about the different categories, and it turns out, again, you could think about the fact that these awake beta oscillations could fit a lot of these categories. But the one that I would focus most on is this could be a really interesting measure of drug target engagement and maybe outcome, right? So yes, we see high beta in kids with Do15Q, but do you need a beta oscillation to diagnose Do15Q? Probably not, we use the genetics really to help us diagnose it. But imagine, if we had a drug that was targeting GABA function, right? So um, maybe it's a negative allosteric modulator GABA, as we know is happening in this trial. You know, if that drug is truly hitting its target, we might expect that biomarker to, to change. And that change in itself might be the measure to tell us that this drug might work. Um, that, and I just want to, again, take a step back and say, like, we don't have biomarkers like that in other conditions. This is truly unprecedented. 
Um, and so again, very exciting. So as we were doing the biomarker work, Roche had this drug that they finally were able to kind of repurpose. So we were kind of doing this work in parallel, right? Like Roche was designing the trial. I was actually involved with helping them with that. And we were also doing all this work getting ready so that if the trial happened, we had the biomarker quantified and we had all those things ready to go. And so that really leads into this, the Quindesim trial. And again, you've heard this a million times. I'm not going to go through all the trial design again. I know you've heard it a million times now. But basmicinil is the drug, and it's a GABA-negative allosteric modulator that specifically binds to GABA-A5 and reduces the activity there. And so the goals of, the dr of this trial are to ask, is it effective? Is it safe? And is this EEG biomarker a measure of drug target engagement? Does it change with treatment? And if it changes, does that change predict clinical outcomes, right? So this is a really different kind of trial design, actually, than most clinical trials, because we now have a biomarker that we can anchor the trial in. So I want to end with sort of a different formulation of how we think about, like, now precision health. And so, you know, we talked about the idea of giving the right patient, the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. And as we, as genetics has, like, really helped us here, you know, we can think about situations, you know, where we have a genetic diagnosis, like Duke 15Q syndrome, right? We know what the clinical kind of features are. And now we develop targeted treatments that eventually we think will really help us um, improve a, a variety of different aspects of daily living skills, functioning, quality of life, all those things that we want to see, you know, um, get easier and better for our kids. But let's now throw the biomarker into this picture, right? So we're going to start kind of in the middle of this schematic. So we'll start with our patient, because this is usually what happens, right? So I see a kid in clinic, a very cute kiddo. Every kid with D50Q is adorable. I've decided that needs to go into the, you know, gene reviews. I don't know why it's not there as one of the features. And amazing parents. That has to, and grandparents. That has to be there as well. But, you know, I see a child with low tone, maybe some of the typical facial features. Maybe they already have epilepsy, developmental delay. And so the first thing I do is genetic testing, right? And we diagnose them with D15Q syndrome. And now we know that there's this really clear biomarker. Okay, so now we have a targeted treatment. And the question becomes, is that targeted treatment potentially going to help this child? And is it going to actually hit the target in the brain, right? And now we have a measure to tell us if that actually could happen, right, based on the, the data I showed you. So this is a signal that we can extract that, again, we did not, we don't have in most conditions. When I'm talking about this in other genetic syndromes, that this bubble is just not even in the schematic, right? We don't have that biomarker of target engagement. And so if that biomarker changes, we can then think about measuring other outcomes. And today I didn't talk about that, but a lot of the outcomes we're looking at in the trial are based on a lot of the studies we did to really figure out what might be the best outcome measures. So with that, I'm just going to end by saying there's some big take-home points here. Um, the most important one in this conference is like the culmination of this, which is these partnerships between all of you and us are key. Without it, none of this works. It doesn't happen. You know, all the clinical trials that we've had in rare disorders actually have been completely fueled by families and by patient advocacy groups. Um, specifically in Duke15Q, this biomarker has unprecedented robustness, I would say. I tend to be use superlatives, but like I really mean it here. It is unprecedented. But we have a lot more to learn, and I think the sleep data that I showed you is an example of that. Um, and I also think this is a great story because it, it, it sort of t tells a story of starting with like really what was a clinical observation by Larry Reiter's group, right, to then research that helped to really put some extra rigor um, and kind of quantification behind that observation. And then that research directly leads to evidence, to clinical trials, and hopefully then better evidence-based clinical care, right? That's like the cycle, and that's what we hope we can do here. Because ultimately what we want is hope, right? And we all have it. Um, I said this yesterday in the fishbowl because we were, and I'm not going down the rabbit hole of talking about cure and all those things. It's a question we always get asked. Um, when I think about therapeutics and cures, what I think about is, you know, I want to be at a place where we can preserve all the joy that our kids bring and all of you bring to the world because they bring a lot of joy and we would never want to eradicate that or minimize it or anything. There's joy. But there's also, I know, a lot of suffering, you know, and a, a, each of you has, I've talked to so many of you in this meeting, there's so many aspects of this condition that we want to fix and we want to cure, 
right? And so I think that the goal of our work is to sort of you know, bring to bear both of those, right? Appreciate the joy and cherish it, but also really help all of you manage those aspects of the condition that really make day-to-day -day life very challenging at times. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna stop and say thank you first and foremost to our kiddos because they, all of them have been willing to be in the study, in our work. Um, and to all of you, of course, and this is a list of all the lab members and the Do15Q folks who are really helpful in doing all of this work. Um, I'm gonna make a shameless plug for two things and then I'll, and I'll take questions. One is that I'm running the marathon for the Alliance in November. I am, so donate, because the money goes to the Alliance. Money goes to the Alliance, not to me. I am not Mike Porath, so I cannot just wake up the morning of the marathon and decide to run it and go out and do 26 miles. This is a large feat, and I'm training very hard. So, but if you guys have already donated, please do, because it goes straight to the Alliance, every, every cent that gets raised. Um, and so that'll be fun. Um, and then the last thing is I've had a lot of questions around seeing us at CHLA in the clinic. And what I will say is that there are always barriers with insurance and things like that, but our team can sort of figure those things out. So if you're interested in coming to us, I, you don't have to, please do not think, there's lots of great clinicians around the country, but if you're interested, I, what, what I'm asking you guys to do is email my assistant, Naomi. If you need to add me, you can, but otherwise she knows, she's already getting a lot of emails. Um, we have a clinic, it's called KIND, which is Kids with neuro Neurogenetic and Developmental Disabilities. That's the umbrella under which the Do15Q clinic sits. And in that clinic, we have genetics, neurology, we have an amazing speech therapist who specializes in nonverbal kids, does a lot of work with AAC. And then Charlotte DeStefano, who you, many of you have met, who's our clinical psychologist, the center of which, of course, of the clinic is our patients. Um, and this clinic, you know, we see kids once a month, but we're actually talking about having a dedicated day for Duke 15Q quarterly so that we can just get everyone in at once um, to make it a little bit easier. Um, again, can't promise with state lines and insurance and things, but we can do our best. CHLA is a safety net hospital, so we basically take all insurance providers except for Kaiser. Um, and so we have been able to accommodate families who don't live in California. Um, and with that, I will stop. Wow, I, can you guys just give her a round of applause again? I was hoping somebody would stand up. I couldn't agree more.